Uh, so welcome to panel six on fostering participation in voting rights. Uh, so we have four papers today. Um, we'll start with Lorraine, who's first up on the list, the criminalization of voting and the fraud of voter fraud. Uh, I believe the notes had indicated that about 10 minutes uh, or so for the actual um, presentation. So if you just want to go ahead and take care of it. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for including me. I'm kind of new to your, your scholarly community. Um, and I apologize to my panelists and my discussant for not having the paper prepared. It's um, both a project in a way I've been working on for 20 years and one that um, I couldn't finish <laughs> in the way that I framed it. But um, um, I, I want to start by um, noting, you know, that Trump's, Donald Trump's Stop the Steal movement um, was fueled by lies about voter fraud. Um, and again, as somebody who studied the question of voter fraud in American elections, literally for more than 20 years now, um, it was shocking to me the, the, the extent to which this idea has gripped the minds of uh, many people in the United States who we call them election deniers and so forth. But, the, but the, at the base is the idea, of course, that there was fraud in the election and that Donald Trump really won um, the election were it not for this fraud. Um, but the seeds were sown for this, uh, frankly, bizarre turn in American politics decades ago. Um, the use of the false claim of voter fraud stretches back, I think, at least to the um, aftermath of the American Civil War at the end of the 19th century, when slavery was abolished, both on the battlefield, but also in the Constitution. Um, and Black men were granted the right to vote. And so voter fraud is a kind of ancient for the United States um, uh, history, young country, is, a, is an ancient racist trope that functions on two levels. Uh, one is the familiar one, perhaps, which is the way in which it's used to justify the regulation of political behavior, the way it's used to justify the rules of, elect, of elections and electoral, po uh, electoral politics. But the second one, which is the one that I wanted to focus on more now in, in my work is, um, is the level at which the trope of voter fraud is used to convey meanings about democracy. And that is that democracy, um, is not fulfilled um, necessarily by full participation. In fact, it's polluted by full participation. That's the idea. The idea is that there are some people among us in the society who are not worthy. They're not worthy of having the vote. And so when you look at this in a historical context uh, in, in the United States, in the history of um, the United States, it's a lot about the purity of the ballot. In fact, that word purity is still in some of the election codes in the states. Um, and so if something is pure, the idea, right, is that it, to, if it's unpure, it's polluted. So I, th I think that's an important point. Um, and I wanted to start, I will share my screen now. Um, with this, let me go to this. Oops. Um, okay. Um, with just a few, uh, uh, I wanted to introduce you to a few people. Some of you, uh, maybe some of the Americans in the in the room, if there are any, uh, might be familiar with uh, this woman, Crystal Mason, um, who after the 2016 election went to vote. She had she was on par uh, probation from a felony conviction for having manipulated um, some uh, tax returns. She worked as a as a preparer of tax returns, 
and I guess she did some kind of financial fraud. She, she was convicted of a felony. She did not have her rights restored in the state of Texas yet, but she didn't know that. And she went to vote um, and she actually had to cast a, a provisional ballot, which is a kind of ballot you cast when they can't find you on the rolls. So she thought she was registered. They said, we can't find your name. We know you, Crystal, but like, in fact, there was a guy who lives across the street from her there. And so she cast this ballot and within a year she, she was arrested for fraud because she voted while she had this felony conviction sentence that wasn't completed yet. Um, and I have this quote from her, um, which I have to get rid of this little screen because I can't read, there we go. Um, where she's saying it was overwhelming. I felt sick, I felt confused. All I kept saying was, please don't let me go back to jail. I didn't want to go back inside. I told myself I'd never do anything to risk that. This is 20, 2017, 2018. And without telling you the long story of the, the, the uh, trauma for her, this is still going on in 2024. She was convicted. She was sentenced to five years in prison for this vote that was not even counted. Um, and her case went through the Texas courts up and down, up to the Texas Supreme Court. It eventually was um, overturned, but a new, newly elected Republican district attorney in the county where she lives has decided to try to try her again. Um, it's very clear they're trying to make an example of Crystal Mason. Um, the second person here, Lanisha Bratcher in North Carolina. Um, she also had a kind of felony conviction where she hadn't even served prison for it, it was for an assault. And she didn't know that she in North Carolina couldn't vote. Uh, and she went and she also cast a ballot, same kind of story. Police came to her door one day, knocked, pounded on her door with her two kids in the, in the room, came, told her she was gonna be arrested, put her in handcuffs, took her away. Um, she eventually also was fighting it for several years. And she eventually did something called an Alfred plea where you basically say, I'm innocent, but I'll plead to being guilty to get this over with. And she was sentenced to um, an unsupervised probation. Um, she also uh, just recently has been told that she may be charged again uh, under different charging um, instructions. Third person, Hervis Rogers. This man, uh, I, again, if you follow American politics, which I don't expect people in this room necessarily to do that, but this was kind of a story because this man, Hervis Rogers, waited almost seven hours in line in a, in a polling place in Texas, in Houston, to vote. And he, cast his ballot. He was actually on the news because he'd waited so long. Um, he too, he had a few months left on probation. He had been convicted of theft in 1995. He went to jail, prison for nine years. He was still on probation in 2020. And he his probation, or his parole rather, would have ended in June. He voted like in May or March in a primary. He too was arrested. And the only reason he didn't get sentenced is because he was arrested by the Texas Attorney General's office. And at the time there was litigation challenging the idea that the Attorney General could, could bring criminal prosecutions. And the courts said, no, you can't do that. That's not your mandate. So his charges were dropped. He too recently was told that they're looking at how they might be able to go after him again. Um, this not new. It's not new. I, I tell you one more person here. Kimberly Prude. Uh, this is someone, I didn't meet her personally, but I interviewed her lawyer back in 20, uh, 2007. She's the woman in the photograph on the left. Um, she was somebody in her 40s, a poor low-income person living in, in inner city Milwaukee. She'd never voted in her life. Um, and she got caught up in the presidential campaign in 2004 when Al Sharpton, an activist, came to Milwaukee, ran a campaign. And in Wisconsin, you could register and vote on the same day within a period of time before the election. 
she got caught up. She was excited about it. They asked her to be a poll worker. She got in, you know, involved. And because she was a poll worker, they told her, you can vote an absentee ballot because you're going to have to be in the polling place on election day. She sent in her absentee ballot. And then she found out she couldn't vote. She also was on probation, uh, parole, because she had been convicted of uh, cashing a bad check, which was a felony in Wisconsin. Um, and so I have a quote here from the judge because again, this case was tried, she lost. Um, it went up to the Seventh Circuit uh, and we have a pretty well-known judge, Diane Wood saying, I find this whole prosecution mysterious. I don't know whether the Eastern District of Wisconsin goes after every felon who accidentally votes. It's not like she voted five times, she cast one vote. So it's not new. And um, what's happening though, since, since 2020, is the ramping up at the state level of, of new laws. And so I'll move quickly. I think I don't have a whole lot of time left, um, but the research questions for this work, uh, why and to what extent are previously permitted voting behaviors and election administration procedures being criminalized? And I'm gonna show you quickly in a minute what some of the evidence of that is. What conduct involving the voting process can a legislature legitimately subject to prohibition and punishment? What meanings are framed by what I'm referring to as the symbolic criminalization of voting? And that's the idea of, of criminalization at this other, you know, at this other level of understanding. And finally, what is the impact of criminalization and, and enforcement on voting and voter mobilization activities? And that's the part that's been really hard because people, you know, are sick of it and they don't want to talk to you about it. Um, I, I did an analysis of laws passed since 2022 using Ballotpedia's election administration legislation tracker. I cast a very wide net. You see there the all the topic areas. I didn't even I didn't use keywords. I just used categories. Um, and then I'll show you a little bit of the actual evidence about voter fraud. Um, but let me just quickly um, give you a sampling of what I'm calling first order criminalization laws that are new crimes, that are harsher, harsher penalties for existing crimes versus second order criminalization, which are laws that um, make it hard for people to comply with the law. And so you get caught up in it and you get set up for potential uh, punishment. And so these these are just, this is just in the last two years, new felony crimes in Arkansas for forging a signature. Um, you see these penalties are fel felony penalties for touching absentee ballot applications. Um, the last one is really a joke. Voting in a primary in which a person is not a bona fide member of and affiliated with the political party holding the primary. In Tennessee, you can't do that. You can't, you, they don't register by political party. Parties don't have members. So nobody even knows how this law is going to be applied. Um, I mentioned uh, harsher, harsher penalties, and this has to do sometimes with increasing crimes, punishments from misdemeanors to felonies. Uh, so West Virginia at the bottom there increases penalties for illegal voting from a misdemeanor, which was up to just one year in the in county jail to a felony where you could get up to 10 years in prison. These are quite harsh penalties. Um, or this one, uh, reenacting existing crimes. So states already have bans on non-citizens voting, but they're passing laws to do it again. Uh, it's the same thing is happening in US Congress. There's a bill in Congress uh, to make it illegal to vote if you're a non-citizen. We already have that law. It was passed in 1996. You can be deported for voting if you're not a citizen in the United States. And I, in my earlier work, I found people, a man who was deported to Pakistan. He lived in the United States for 20 years. He didn't even vote. He accidentally got registered to vote through the Motor Voter Bill. They deported him. Um, Prohibitions on assisting voters. This is a very important area that doesn't get as much attention um, as it should. And so this has to, a lot to do with um, regulating groups that try to get, the, get out the vote or try to get people registered. And this has pretty much shut down voter registration drives in the state of Florida. 
right now. Um, second order, and I, I, I think I'm out, almost out of time. I'm looking. I'm way over. Okay. Um, second order restrictions on third party groups, some crazy things, Pro prohibiting handwritten absentee ballot educations, prohibiting drop boxes, prohibiting uh, election agencies from prepaying for postage on absentee ballots, uh, et cetera, creating new enforcement agencies uh, to go after ele non-existent election crimes. And finally, um, prohibiting reforms that increase turnout. States are passing laws, sometimes putting it in their constitution to ban same-day registration, ban ranked check choice voting, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing um, and, and leave you with the, the last part of this, which is there's, there's manifest evidence that voter fraud is not a problem in the United States. So the question is why? What, what, are, they, what are they doing? And my, my, my short answer to it is that we're in a new age of performative politics and that the performance is for the audience uh, that the politicians want to vote for them. But there is real collateral damage. And that's the part that I haven't done. So, um, uh, and I can't share with you, obviously. But anyway, thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over after not providing a paper. So I'm a doubly bad person <laughs> that way. I apologize so much, but I was very excited to be part of your, your group. So thank you. Well, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, got me a lot more interested in voting issues in the States. So Anna Unger is next. Yeah, yeah and thanks. And I also, I mean, I couldn't uh, finish my paper either for quite uh, several reasons. And also I have to tell that my uh, presentation is not less depressing than the first one. I mean, when it comes to the topic itself, it's about, hopefully you see my slide already. I mean, it's okay, maybe this way. Uh, uh, here is a kind of, maybe it's better now. Yeah, I guess you see, uh, I, I do hope. Um, and my topic is about dire democracy in Hungary. This is the final, probably this is the very final uh, presentation at a conference of this project of mine. It took four years until I, I tried to analyze uh, why we have no referendums at all, though, why people cannot initiate referendums, though Hungary, uh, introduced direct democracy in a very, would say, liberal wide way during the political transition of 1989. However, we had no referendums uh, that were proposed by the people since then. And this was a very regular question I got from scholars from all around the world whenever I went to conferences that how come that by law we have a very user friendly people-friendly legislation, rules about initiatives and referendums, and the practices practices uh, uh, relatively zero. So my question was, and I know, and I have to tell that this is a bit, I mean, this is the weak, weak point uh, of, of the whole topic that it is extremely Hungary oriented or, or oriented. It's really hard to publish anything because you know what is interesting is in Hungary is Orban and populism and stuff like this. And when you start to analyze deeper movements, deeper uh, patterns and longer historical tendencies, it's not so interesting for the international uh, attention. So it's not really easy to to publish anything. However, I try to solve. I try to 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 answer the question why. Do the institutions of the idea of democracy never work in Hungary and never worked? And also, this uh, the, the answer can help us to understand why does agenda initiative of the European Union uh, doesn't work in the EU? Because there we saw the same. We have more than hundred in hundred initiatives, and none of them were uh, really uh, successful. And not because people are not really interested but because the rules and the criteria sometimes are 
are too strict or the procedure is, is impossible to overcome. Here you can see a, a quick analysis or quick summary of the Hungarian proposals. Since 1989, since we introduced referendums into the constitutional order, we had eight national referendums, four were proposed by the government, uh, three were proposed by opposition parties, one was proposed by an independent member of the parliament, zero was successful, that was proposed by the people. I mean, we we have more than a thousand, okay, more than a thousand uh, referendum proposals since 1989, and none of them managed to reach that stage that we can decide. We, we reached the ballot uh, uh, stage. My research method was a qualitative analysis, namely a discourse analysis, because I didn't want to analyze the, the legal documents on their own. Instead, I wanted to understand what is the argument behind the legislation? What is the argument behind the decisions of the electoral management bodies and the electoral justice uh, and electoral justice decisions like constitutional court decisions, high court decisions and stuff like this, because my idea is and my idea was and I managed to understand it and, and, and describe it properly that the problem was not with the so, so that the problem lays in the understanding of democracy. That's why I, that whether direct democracy belongs to democracy according to these institutions or not. So first I tried to do, and I did a critical discourse analysis, I analyzed namely 1,200 legal texts, including the, the parliamentary debates, constitutional court decisions, and so on. And also I did an institutional approach. I compared the international best practices of initiative and referendum and also uh, the, the the worst practice, I mean, which is probably Hungary. Um, and what I found is that the starting point is different from the when it comes to democracy. Uh, I, what, what I mean on the starting point is that when we talk about voting rights and we talk about elections, we take it for granted that we have international uh, human rights agreements and we understand democracy as the realization of the will of the people and we take it for granted that though the former uh, the previous uh, uh, presentation showed that it's it shouldn't be taken for granted how that voting rights are equal and universal and we have the right to participate in 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 politics to 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 make our voice heard however this is not the case for direct democracy. And my uh, pattern for analyzing the, the documents was that, okay, what these documents say when they talk about voting rights, how the government, how the constitutional court uh, decides on issues that belong to voting rights issues, voting rights in case of elections, elections and how do they argue democracy? And it is about direct democracy, it is about uh, referendums and uh, initiatives. And what was pretty interesting for me that in case of voting rights, that we shall have guarantees to protect our voting rights, and we shall have uh, practices and procedures that protect the representatives and the institutions and the people. And this is what is missing on the argument the understanding of democracy when it comes to direct democracy. Uh, in case of uh, uh, referendums, as the, the let's say the political discussions, and I have a summary in the coming slides. I don't want to spend next thing, but it's very important here. It comes to to and voting rights. They are. I mean, the, the politicians and electoral management bodies, decision makers, no they are in favor of turning voting rights participation, unlike either democracy, they are again the wider representative participation of the people. And there is this kind of between the two kinds. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, she's frozen for me too, Angela. I wasn't sure if it was on my end or not. Nope. She probably got kicked out. Okay. Maybe you give her... Oh, there we go. She's coming back. Okay. I also think her, her slide was frozen. Yeah. On the uh, on the first one. Yeah, it's essential. Hello? Hello, do you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, but you don't see my slides, I guess. No. And I think they were no. frozen on the first slide. Oh, I think she's frozen again. But I tried on the, the slides again. And this is where I was. So hopefully connection is unstable. Yes. Hopefully it's better now. So what is the context here in a nutshell is that Again, unlike the international practice, when they divide initiative and referendum, and initiative is about new proposals, then you write the whole text and you put it to the people and they support it or not. And referendum is after usually a decision made by the parliament and you may say yes or no into the question. The Hungarian legislative body never divided these two institutions and it is an extremely I would say after this late era, it's a very stupid uh, system in that sense that it is the obligation of the parliament to pass the law, but you have to give in the in that simple question that you want to put to the popular the, the, the full. So if you want to easing the, the, the citizenship or whatever, you have to formulate a question that refers to a full bill without having the bill. And you don't get it this way. You don't get the help from institutions. And the rules and the hope the four topics that the question cannot uh, a question that somehow whatever you do in the effects budget, even the, the popular vote itself affects election uh, needs uh, money. So what is what is the consequence is that you never know whether your question will pass the admissibility test or not. And this is a very interesting, would say, to, to be polite, a very special uh, story that there are three filters in order to pass uh, the, 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 the whole procedure. First, you have to certify, verify the question, and here that that's the place where that's the phase where everyone fails, with the exception of parties, when they sometimes manage to pass, and sometimes it takes years until you can get through the whole process. Then you can start the signature gathering, and you can have the campaign. Uh, what are the consequences? What are what is the analysis? Uh, uh, the the legislative body, it's very interesting. the The focus of the of the political debates around direct democracy was always about how to limit democracy, how to limit direct democracy, how to limit the the access of the people, how to secure the autonomy of the of the of the elected bodies, and how to protect representation and democracy from the people, which is which is pretty interesting, but not. Uh, uh, of it's it's not not uh, not new thing if you think to Burke's idea about democracy and and the people's representation it was quite similar to this or Madison's ideas, and the 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 discussions and negotiations and arguments of EMB and electoral just, justice institution and this is what I think is uh, more important as it they had a very strict focus on legal issues and. The standards they require from the people to 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 respect when we start a proposal are not collected. We have thousands of different decisions that we should know on our own. We get no legal expertise. We get no legal help from the electoral management bodies. 
because their understanding is the same than of the parliament, the, the legislative body, that they protect the representative institutions, representative democracy uh, against the direct democratic systems. And what is pretty problematic that while the electoral management bodies have the responsibility to analyze and to follow, to do follow-up analysis of the four procedures usually in the post-election cycle in, in to, to, to help with their expertise, the people, this is rarely or never done in case of direct democracy. So the conclusions, uh, the legislation is pretty poor. However, the option of getting a popular vote is in the system because they do not dare to clear to delete direct democratic institutions from the constitution because this was one of the, 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 chief, uh, the, the key achievement of the regime change. The electoral management bodies and electoral justice institutions are actually forced to be the bad cops. So it's not the legislative body that say that we don't need democracy, but the whole procedure is, is, is manufactured in that way that these institutions shall, uh, shall behave as a kind of den against the will of the people when they want to start something is the electoral national election office that will say, for years that no, this question is not good. You have to reformulate it. You have to reformulate it without providing any help for the citizens. That's why the outcomes are absolutely unforeseeable and popular would serve as political weapons. Now, the problem is, and this is how I finish, uh, is that this could not happen in a in a bad democracy, even in a in a in a in a well organized autocratic system. I guess that. Uh, in case of electoral, this this kind of chaotic, uh, under organized and uncivil or uh, not user friendly friendly approach could not happen in case of the representative institutions and the representative bodies. Constitutional court would not let people uh, uh, could not let institutions to to misuse the democratic procedures or to undermine the democratic procedures in case of elected bodies. And uh, the way I want to finish is that in case of direct democracy, what we see is universal voting rights is not so universal or not yet universal. However, we cannot have democracy without the demons. And you may ask me why I put this, why I put this, this picture into the final slide. Uh, the argument is pretty clear. Whenever I hear arguments against direct democracy, they are literally similar arguments against women's voting rights. Uh, that we are not able to decide, we are not smart enough, we are too emotional. If you replace the argument, if you replace the word women uh, with the word people in recent arguments against voting, uh, against direct democracy, you get the same arguments of the, of the 20th century and the 19th century uh, literature against uh, women's vote, voting rights and the black people voting rights or uh, in the US. So I guess that maybe I'm too 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 emotional. Maybe I, I have too high dreams, but what I think is that in case of democracy, we shouldn't, I mean electoral management bodies and electoral justice institutions shouldn't differentiate direct and indirect version of democracy. They should they should uh, focus on voting rights. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that presentation. We have Antonetta coming up next on Tanzania and Liberia. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, please confirm you can hear me clearly. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Okay. My name is Antonietta Hamandishe. Uh, I'm connecting from Liberia uh, in Africa. So uh, I was looking at understanding the connection between invalid votes 
disenfranchisement and voter turnout and looking at the implication of those uh, on democratic participation. And I was looking at uh, Tunisia 2022 uh, parliamentary elections and Liberia 2023 general elections. Uh, and in terms of the background and why I chose those two case studies, uh, for those that were following the Liberia elections last year, I think they were notable for a number of positive uh, aspects uh, in terms of the transparency, uh, accountability in terms of the election management body, but also the overall turnout, which was uh, a little bit high. Nevertheless, uh, it, there was a significant high number of invalid votes, and it kind of acted as a um, taint in terms of the overall election process. And flipping over to, to Tunisia, I think it drew the world's attention in terms of the lowest number of um, voter turnout. I think it recorded 11%, which was uh, historical given the country's uh, previous um, uh, elections. So in terms of the background, uh, obviously, as I indicated, in terms of Tunisia, it was um, motivated by the declining voter turnout, which is being recorded uh, globally. If you look at countries like South Africa recently, I think it recorded 50 eight percent and in terms of liberia in 2023 elections it also recorded a significant lower number of uh voter turnout and coming to to tunisia it was also the case but also there's a significant drop in terms of uh voter participant uh participation in terms of uh in the recent elections and coming over to liberia the significant uh high number of invalid votes i think uh it uh, warranted something to really look deeper into the case considering that uh from their 2017 elections they recorded 5.14 percent and for this previous election they recorded 5.86 so the main uh more motivation on my side was why are they not uh, improving in terms of the number of invalid uh, votes uh, being uh, recorded? And um, as you may all appreciate, invalid votes can significantly impact on the election outcome, especially where the election uh, race is very close, uh, particularly in, in the case of Liberia. And I'm going to expand that a little bit uh, later. And high number of invalid votes may lead to allegations of irregularities or malpractices. And all that combined can have an uh, effect in terms of democratic participation. Uh, and coming to review of literature, I, I did have a look uh, on a number of literature. For example, if you look in terms of the international idea database, you find that in as much as Liberia recorded 5.68% uh, in terms of the turnout, it is still within the global average of 4.3%. But like what I indicated earlier, the the comparison of 2023 elections and 2017 elections in Liberia showed that there was a negative improvement in, in, in the sense that there was an increase again in terms of the invalid votes. And also in terms of voter turnout, you will find that uh, in authoritarian regimes, countries like Rwanda, they do show a, a high number of uh, voter Turn out despite the electoral uh, processes uh, being, uh, you know, highly um, e participatory, and this brings into into question the aspect of quality of, of elections or even the indicators of integrity. To say, do we look in terms of high turnout or we just look in in terms of average participation? Because even the worst regimes they can record high voter turnout. E Terminating out even the quality of the um, elections are poor. And then in terms of electoral irregularities, instances of forced uh, propaganda, biased registration and ballot box staffing can, can also ca characterize those regimes that record high voter turnout. So given this background, I think there's a need for comprehensive electoral reform, emphasizing on, on the need to, to enhance voter confidence and also to, to, to strengthen or improve uh, election integrity. So 
uh, as you may all appreciate, elections, they allow citizens to elect uh, representatives and shape public uh, policies. And this is very crucial for democratic uh, governance. And when it comes to issues of invalid votes, disenfranchisement and low voter turnout, they do tend to threaten the legitimacy of the government and the overall democratic uh, systems. And coming to Tunisia 22 elections, as I indicated earlier in the background, the, the country recorded uh, the lowest voter turnout ever. And for Liberia 2023 uh, elections, which I mentioned earlier, that it was a closely contested uh, election because in the in, in incumbent lost by 20,000 votes. But if you look in terms of the number of invalid votes for the first round, it was 7,000 only. So, it also brings into aspects to say what really causes invalid votes and how are those ballots being invalidated, especially in closely contested ele um, elections like Liberia 2023 elections. So the main key questions that were guiding my, that were, I'm sorry, my connection is a little bit bumpy. So the key questions that were guiding my, my study was how do invalid votes affect voter turnout and overall democratic participation looking at Tunisia and Liberia 2023 elections? And what are the primary causes of invalid votes in these elections? And how do they relate to voter confusion and procedural errors? And what systematic and legal barriers contribute to disenfranchisement? And how do these factors interfere with the voter turnouts in the two contexts? And lastly, how do invalid votes disenfranchisement collectively influence the perceived legitimacy of elections and democratic processes in Tunisia and Liberia. And in terms of methodology, I, I used a comparative, um, I used a comparative perspective in terms of uh, uh, looking at Tunisia 2022 elections and Liberia 2023 elections. And I got the data from diverse sources, including official election observation reports, commission reports, but also I benefited largely from my ethnographic experience because uh, I, I, I was deployed and I'm still deployed in Liberia as a long-term uh, election observer. So, so some of my insights and also the key interviews I, I, I held with uh, the different stakeholders contributed to the findings. Uh, from this study. Uh, so my analysis entailed a detailed examination of election processes, including legal and administrative frameworks, voter education initiatives, and measures to address disenfranchisement. Uh, and I used the different variables to explore the relationships between these two elements, invalid votes, sorry, three elements, invalid votes, disenfranchisement, and voter turnout. Um, then going on, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, due to time, I'm just going to zoom into the main findings, and I'll start by Tunisia. So Tunisia recorded a historically low voter turnout uh, of 11.66%, which is the lowest in the country's history, indicating a widespread disillusionment with the political, economic, and social conditions. And uh, this is based on the fact that in 2021, a year before the 2022 elections, the president introduced a number of uh, uh, reforms which were very unpopular. I mean, he dissolved the parliament uh, against the public will. Uh, so that column contributed to some form of voter apathy because uh, many voters, it is assumed, were no longer interested in the election because they regarded the dissolution of parliament as a presidential coup or, uh, I mean, or a unilateral decision which was not popular to many. Then also I found out that there was a dis disillusionment with the political system of Tunisia. Many Tunisians felt that the government failed to address the issues that led to the 2011 revolution. I mean, to those who still remember the revolution which happened in 2011, which ushered in new democracy in Tunisia. So the public felt that uh, the current government was no longer in tune uh, with the ethos of the 2011 uh, revolution. So that contributed to apathy and skepticism about the electoral process of 2022. Uh, okay, I'm being reminded of time here. Okay. And also, uh, the low voter turnout was because of the youth disengagement, young people had the lowest voter turnout, according to the data from electoral commission. And this reflected dissatisfaction with the unaddressed demands from the 20. 
21 protests. And also the issues of security concerns and distrust were very widespread, um, especially among the political institutions. And this further detailed voter participation in questioning the legitimacy of the electoral process uh, as a whole. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there was the crisis of legitimacy um, and also lack of political reforms. Uh, there, were, there was significant uh, lack of political reforms and the perception of a stagnant political landscape, which diminished somehow voter, voter enthusiasm. And also, um, okay. And then obviously there was failure in public um, engagement from the government side. I'll quickly jump into uh, to look at the findings from Liberia so that I don't miss my time as such. So in terms of Liberia, uh, the key findings in terms of what caused the invalid votes was mainly the design of the ballot uh, paper itself and adequate voter education and also the complex voting system and the issuing of more than one ballot paper uh, was mentioned as one of the reasons, but also the administrative lapses. Uh, for example, there was ineffective training of election officials and deficiencies in the electoral commission's guidelines, which led to inconsistencies in handling and validating votes. For example, there was limited understanding of ballot validation and there was limited uh, cross con confirmation between the presiding officers and the party agents. There was also delayed and insufficient civic and voter education. I think it started two months before the election. So this contributed to the insignificant number of invalid votes uh, besides the poor road infrastructure uh, in Liberia. And also the polling place issues, uh, most of the polling places were, were places were small, overcrowded, and they were poor, uh, they had poor light and inadequate uh, facilities, which contributed to voters not being able to correctly mark their ballots. But also there was another uh, interesting issue which came out to say some voters were, were just voting, I mean, uh, not being careful because they had lost trust in the candidate. So you find some voters voting or or expressing their choices on more than two or three can, uh, candidates. I do have uh, an example here of uh, how the ballot paper looks like in Liberia, and or or and also the the different mean different means through which uh, voters could e express their um, their their choices. One through a mark, uh, a cross, or a thumb. So those three ways of voting, according to the discussions I had with uh, different stakeholders, also contributed to the confusion in terms of how one can uh, express their, their choices. Uh, besides the long ballot paper, and as you can see, with, with more than 17 candidates, especially for the House of uh, Representative level. And then another issue was also the long queues and small voting rooms, which contributed to voter mistakes, and also the um, uh, issue of uh, lack of political party representatives having no or limited education in terms of what constitutes uh, an invalid vote. So you find that in the party agents had li limited interaction with the presiding officers. And in most cases, the presiding officer would have the final say in terms of what determines or what constitutes an invalid vote. And then in terms of the implications, I think the 78% voter turnout in Liberia signifies a high level of civic engagement, which is very positive in terms of democratic participation because it reflects a stronger sense of political involvement compared to the previous years. But if you look in terms of the significant rate of invalid votes, which was at 5.86%, it raises concerns about the effectiveness of voter education in the ballot uh, clarity itself. So addressing these issues, I think, is crucial for ensuring accurate and meaningful participation in, in elections. And coming back to Tunisia, I think the 11% voter turnout suggests a high level of political disillusionment and the trust in the electoral system. And this low engagement points to underlying issues such as um, inadequate voter education or maybe authoritarian uh, item, uh, tendencies. And um, while Liberia shows an upward trend in voter engagement, uh, given the 78% voter turnout, the rise in, in invalid votes highlights persistent challenges 
Tunisia is stable but lower voter turnout. I think it shows ongoing difficulties in fostering widespread political participation and trust in elections. And uh, I'm being and I do have a slide which shows the the connection between the two variables, but I don't know how good I'm doing in terms of time. Uh, but I, I just want to, to emphasize that there's a close link between invalid votes, voter turnout, and uh, disenfranchisement. From I mean, for example, invalid votes, especially when they are high, they tend to undermine confidence in the electoral process, and this discourage voter turnout uh, in terms of the future elections. And the presence of invalid votes often signals systematic barriers faced by disenfranchised groups, for example, those that cannot read or write, and these highlight um, challenges in effective voting. And uh, disenfranchisement also, I think, it reduces the number of eligible voters, uh, which leads to lower overall voter turnout and potentially higher rates of invalid votes. And invalid votes uh, and disenfranchisement, I think they do create a cycle of disengagement where affected individuals are less likely to participate in future elections due to perceived or real barriers. And um, I, I just want to, to, to end on a positive note to say, in as much as invalid votes and a low voter turnout are not good for democratic participation, there are mechanisms that can be put in place uh, to, to, to try to, add to, to address those. For example, um, there is need for effective voter education campaigns to mitigate these issues. Uh, and also, I think there's need to implement accessible voting systems. There is need to, to, to put in place effective legislative uh, reforms, especially on the part of the government, which shows, which shows transparency, which promotes accountability, and also removing any uh, aspects of mistrust or any forms of uh, voting barriers. And also trust in the electoral- Antonetta, um, we're way over time. Okay. Is there a final comment, like one sentence that you can say? All right. Okay. So I just want to um, to conclude by saying that as billions of citizens this year are due to, to participate in elections, I suggest that most attention must be focused on who wins and by what majority and to check if the intentions of those who would have voted uh, uh, was clear and if it counted at all. Thank you so much. And my apologies for going beyond time. Okay, so our final presentation is Regina and Whitney. Great. Um, Whitney is going to kick us off. Perfect. Here we go. Whitney, you're muted, or at least you're muted for me. <laughs> I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Pfeiffer. Uh, she, her pronouns, and I am the Glide Program Manager um, at Outright International, and also joined by uh, Regina Waugh, who is the Senior Global Gender Advisor at IFIS. Um, and we are presenting from a practitioner side, so we don't have a paper that we uploaded. However, we'll put a plug in for uh, the launch of this landscape analysis that we're about to dive into um, at the end of the month. If you're interested in joining, uh, we'll launch the report and discuss uh, some of the findings um, in addition to what we're about to discuss today, which is about liberating voters um, and the enfranchisement of LGBTQI plus citizens in elections. Uh, so we're just going to do a really quick background on Glide, the program that we implement um, in collaboration between Outright International, IFIS, and Synergia Initiative for Human Rights. Um, and then Regina is going to talk us through some of the findings that we found through the secondary research key format interviews and surveys. So GLIDE stands for the Global LGBTQI Plus Inclusive Democracy and Empowerment Initiative. We call it GLIDE because it's a mouthful. Um, and GLIDE is really uh, trying to um, increase access to and participation in leadership of LGBTQI Plus individuals in the democratic space and to utilize democratic engagement and processes as a tool for furthering their rights as LGBTQI plus communities, but then to also be key leaders and um, 
and to, to be key leaders in advancing and countering democratic uh or countering democratic backsliding but also mitigating and and strengthening existing democratic uh standards that are already in place uh glide has a lot of different components including grants uh, capacity, strengthening assistance, research, publications, and convenings. And this is all to try and generate interest among LGBTQI plus people uh, to want to build the skills and knowledge to participate meaningfully in democratic processes and engage in public and political life. Um, to support broader LGBTQI plus organizations and movements uh, to um, basically utilize democratic mechanisms as a way to mitigate intolerance, violence, and discrimination experienced by LGBTQI plus people. And then also to try and better elevate um, LGBTQI plus conversations in, in broader democracy spaces. So engage a variety of stakeholders that are involved in the democracy space to understand the links between advancing LGBTQI plus rights and dem democratic participation and rights. And so um, GLIDE, um, to do this, and initially GLIDE did a landscape analysis in 2023 as a way to kind of help set the scope for the project because democratic participation and engagement is quite broad. Um, and so the landscape analysis initially informed our first rounds of grant making um, under the initiative. Uh, this 2024 landscape analysis um, is much more robust and builds on that 2023 analysis um, and consists of desk research where we looked at a variety of democracy indices, LGBTQI plus reports, both academic and on the practitioner side, news sources, um, resources that partners have developed in the field, um, and pr pretty much anything that looked at this topic. Um, we also conducted primary research through a global survey um, where we received 190 responses from around the world um, and 45 key informal interviews with activist experts and academics also around the world. The report that we will talk be talking about primarily from the elections lens today will be coming out at the end of the month and it looks at key findings, gaps in knowledges, um, promising practices and recommendations based on the analysis conducted through the desk research and the primary research. So the desk review was very comprehensive. Um, and as I mentioned, it, top, it tackled a variety of um, indices that already exist, including variety of democracies and Freedom House. We also looked at a variety of reports recently from the Williams Institute and UNDP on LGBTQI plus political participation. There's also a variety of academic resources, um, as well as we're seeing a few articles coming out of the, the NEDS Journal for Democracy, for example. Um, and what we're finding is that elections obviously are a very key component of, of analysis this year for democracy because of this mega year of elections. And that key and that high elections can be a really key factor in the continuation of either democratic backsliding or the prevention of democratic backsliding. Um, and that it's important to think about elections as we head into this major year. Um, particularly because elections can be a hotspot for LGBTQI plus communities. Um, and, and Regina will talk a little bit more about what that looks like. But we do know that there's escalation around violence um, and online attacks and, and other forms of discrimination towards LGBTQI plus people in the lead up to elections. Uh, we also know that scapegoating is a very useful tool in political party and candidate campaigns, um, which is also leading to and resulting in um, attacks um, on LGBTQI plus people um, as a result of these, uh, these campaigns. Um, the literature also found that, um, you know, that there is a contrast between democratic backsliding and LGBTQI plus rights with the caveat um, that, you know, although we're seeing um, more than we, you know, more laws being passed to protect the, the rights of um, LGBTQ plus people and decriminalizing content, consensual same-sex activity, we are also still seeing brand new policies that are limi limiting the rights um, and openly discriminating against LGBTQ plus people. Um, and a lot of these are targeting um, 
you know, those experiencing disproportionate impacts within this umbrella, including transgender communities, um, who often are at the brunt of a lot of these um, really hate-filled uh, democratic uh, or election campaigns. Uh, we're also seeing that LGBTQ plus rights uh, uh, is increasingly polarized when it comes to the support. People are either for or against. There's not a lot of middle ground. Um, and that can make it very difficult when making the arguments for why um, LGBTQ plus people should be participating in these processes to begin with. Um, and then one of the last things that we found from the key findings, among many other findings, um, is that um, with populism on the rise, elections have been less helpful for LGBTQI plus rights. Um, and as I mentioned before, in some cases um, leads to political violence um, and is often utilized as a tool to um, call out um, other candidates and either force them out of the race. Um, making it, it can also make it very difficult for LGBTQ plus people to go to the polls and vote. Um, and as Regina will talk a little bit to is the fact that people, LGBTQ plus people just don't necessarily trust elections and therefore are not turning out to vote. And I'll hand it over to Regina to talk about the survey and key informed interview findings. Great. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide for me. Whitney has very kindly uh, offered to, to help run through these for me. Um, so, so in both um, the key informant interviews and the survey, we collected information, you know, kind of broadly and then more specifically about the LGBTQI plus communities participation in civic and democratic processes. And of course, we we started but did not end in asking about elections and, and participation in elections. So we asked questions about uh, voting habits, access, any challenges uh, they may have experienced, um, and then also experience with or interest in running for office. So, so you know, approaching elections from the candidate perspective, and then broader participation in, in political and civic um, activities. So um, obviously the, the information that's up here on this slide is speaking a bit to, to some of the summarized findings from the survey itself. So we started off by asking people about their, their identification and whether or not they had the identification that they needed to vote. And you'll see here that the vast majority of people from all around the world that, that responded to the, the survey said, yes, they do have that ID. Um, but with a pretty significant, um, you know, pers uh, difference for people who are um, transgender or may or non-binary or um, or intersex, meaning that only about half of our respondents actually um, had reported that they had the identification that properly reflected their gender ide identity, and that might be uh, the the incorrect gender marker, a uh, photo that it, that was that is not how they they present, or uh, their a, a different name, their dead name, for example. So that's a pretty a pretty significant um, difference for for our population. On issues of participation, um, we asked basically whether people were, were registered to vote and then also whether they had, had voted in their, their country's last election. Again, the, the majority of, of, of respondents indicated that they were registered. Um, a, a smaller majority indicated that they had voted in their last election. And, and Whitney mentioned this a bit when it, in, in her last comments, we asked people kind of to select from a list of reasons and they could also write in their own responses about why, like why they, they may have chosen not to vote. And the top three were they didn't trust the electoral process. Um, they, there was a sense that all politicians are corrupt. And then perhaps not surprisingly, the third was my vote would not make a difference. Um, and, you know, I think we're seeing generally, perhaps globally, a, a, a significant increase in kind of feelings of apathy and, and concern about whether or not democracy and democratic processes actually deliver change. And that is certainly uh, bore out in, in terms of our, our findings. Um, and then with we also asked about barriers to voting. I thought this was very interesting. Only about 12% of our respondents reported having faced barriers themselves but the vast majority of them believed that LGBTQI plus people in their country uh, faced uh, moderate to significant barriers in trying to vote, including discrimination, lack of identification, which we've, we, that was borne out in our findings, um, and violence or fear of violence. Whitney, you can go to the next slide for me. Um, so when, sorry, oh yeah, that's not changing on my end, but I'll, I'll quickly uh, talk a little bit more about this. And, and Whitney had alluded to the challenges that um, that that 
we're seeing around election time for LGBTQI plus people. And, and one you know big one is just that it can be a particularly dangerous time in part because we're seeing uh, political leaders, politicians, their supporters really leveraging um, what in some in many places is, a, is an unpopular group of people um, and, and really ramping up dangerous rhetoric, rhetoric, which sometimes is there all the time, but really escalates in the electoral period. So when we think about people not being interested in voting or not feeling like it's going to make a difference, there's also a significant amount of risk in participating in these processes. Um, in places where there's a more supportive environment, uh, our, our respondents, our, our key informant interviewees in particular noted that, you know, there may be more a more supportive environment. We may see political parties kind of nodding or including in their platforms the mention of LGBTQI plus issues, you know, running a rainbow flag at their events. But this kind of pinkwashing really does not translate into any sort of actual support and the actual practice um, in, in their work. Um, I think, you know, the community is engaging generally with with political parties and candidates and elected officials kind of despite these challenges and despite this this lack of desire to to um, or lack of belief, maybe that, that things will change. But but fundamentally, LGBTQI plus people really want to see themselves in their leaders. And there was a, a very felt sense that um, that that. LGBTQI plus people are going to have to be elected. They're going to have to actually be those leaders themselves in order to expect for things to change. And while there are, you know, our respondents noted they know many people who may be um, members of the community, but they're not out and they're not bringing their identity to their, their political work. Um, Whitney, we can go to the next slide and we're, we're wrapping up, I promise. Um, so just a couple of promising practices and maybe I'll end there so that we have a little bit more time for discussion. But seeing some of the ways that that LGBTI uh, QI plus organizations are engaging in these processes, um, you know, working with feminist organizations, for example, to pool resources and ideas to share with political candidates in advance of the elections. Um, in South Africa, we were working with a group who is partnered with the electoral management body specifically to help ensure that their their voter education is reaching the community and uh, making sure that that people know how to vote and make sure that they're not accidentally spoiling their ballot ballots, make sure that they know where to go. Um, and then in, in Sri Lanka, where there have been challenges with trans people being able to vote and being safe and free of harassment when doing so, um, there's organizations there that are working with the EMB to ensure that there's kind of a, a trained uh, and friendly presence for, for LGBTQI plus people um, at each polling station. So we have some some broader findings, but I might hold off on those because they're a little bit further away from the um, from from the elections topic specifically. And I know we're we're short on time, and I want to make sure people can can ask questions and we can have a good discussion. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. So we have our discussant next, uh, the other Anna, or one of the other Annas, yeah, Anna. So if you want to go ahead. Uh, thank you, Angelina. Uh, uh, Angelina, yeah. um, uh, my name is Anna Fedrydebka. I'm from Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun in Poland. Uh, thank you very much for all the interesting presentations. I will try to go with the order in which they were presented. Uh, Maybe first, please tell me, tell me if you hear me. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Um, uh, of course, um, I think like the, the, the biggest comment will be for Antonetta because um, uh, her work was on the Dropbox. Um, but I would really like to thank uh, for inviting me here and um, uh, giving me this uh, honored role to be a discussant. This this I will try to uh, comment all of the works. Um, uh, if it comes to uh, Lorraine, I to tell the truth, I was really shocked by the examples. Uh, it must be very huge database. If you told that you are on this topic for more than uh, than twenty uh, than twenty years, and I am really curious about the examples of the legal definition of the purity of the ballot. It's something that cuts my mind. And uh, is there, with all these legal changes, 
do you see some uh, uh, the same line line of uh, in different states of the uh, ratio legis behind all of these amendments? This would be my uh, uh, my two questions. And are there the possibilities, uh, or if they are used or not, to uh, check the compliance of these legal amendments with the basic election standards? Yeah. So the basic principles of the uh, of the elections, because some of they are in the manner in which you showed. Uh, non compliable with the, for example, uh, universal suffrage, uh, in my opinion. Um, that would be uh, for the first presentation. Uh, to um, Professor Anna Ungar, um, I really, I'm really inspired by, uh, by your presentation. I'm very sorry that, that it was a bit interrupted because of the uh, uh, connection issues. Uh, I am uh, wondering because in Poland, I think we do have some similarities in our regulations concerning the um, initiation of the referendum by the uh, by the citizens. Uh, but in our case, unfortunately, this is the lower chamber chamber of the parliament who is stating if the questions are uh, good or not. Um, so um, it's quite similar. We. We have these uh, regulations, but we have like not really many referendums. And if we are doing them, we are doing them in the Hungarian style. So it's simply uh, abuse of state resources uh, examples. Um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, in your opinion, if there is some one amendment which would be change the whole situation in the procedure. Do you see this point in which there is the ability to make a small amendment to enfranchise the voters in the circumstances of the referendum? And secondly, because the period in uh, uh, in which you were interested in is the is quite huge, yeah. So the, after the eighty nine, and is there a change in practice after the uh, Orban made the amendments of the constitution? This would be my second question. If I remember correctly, it was the two thousand fourteen uh, when it came into the force. Um, to um, to Antonetta and Antonetta, if you are interested, I made some notes uh, in the comments form on your paper. If you would like, I can um, I can send it to you. Um, I'm very grateful that you made this effort and put this file on the Dropbox. And just few short thoughts. Uh, first of all, I I was being taught uh, in my academic career to compare the comparable. So in, I'm not really sure if this, in which terms these two cases of the states are really comparable. I was trying to catch your thought in the terms of this really inspiring flowchart. And I do hope that some of my um, uh, further comments will help you to uh, elaborate a little more uh, on it because uh, I'm I see a, a quite big need from the uh, perspective of a reader to put more stress on uh, the definitions of the terms. What do you understand by the term of disenfranchisement? This was really uh, not so. Um, strict in your uh, in your paper. I'm not sure if you mean the people which are legally disenfranchised by the law, or do you mean the people who are not able to vote even though they have the right, they want to vote, but they are not able. And the third group is the people about whom you are writing a bit, I think, uh, which are really 
simply not interesting, interested in voting because they they simply don't want. Probably the system is is encouraging them. But for me, these are three different phenomena, especially the first one, because it's simply the the what what goes in the constitution, probably, uh, or in the electoral codes. And I think the distinctions should be made in the paper in terms of that. Secondly, uh, in these two states, in the legal provision, what does it mean that the vote is invalid? That um, I would really like to see these provisions uh, in the paper because uh, from your expertise and from what you observed, I think uh, there were some uh, examples of um, stating that the ballot is invalid by the precinct commission in terms of like, rigging, rigging the votes, yeah. So uh, first of all, I think there is a need to show to the reader when by the law, the vote simply is, uh, uh, is invalid. And I would really encourage you to look at uh, one paper uh, connected <laughs> with, with a Polish uh, example, not really um, one to be, uh, to be proud of. Uh, in 2014, we did have like a huge number of invalid votes in our local elections. But uh, three professors uh, from Poland wrote, in my opinion, a very good paper about it. And I do think, like, even though the Polish case may be not interesting for you, but you can find uh, there uh, a lot of uh, uh, good uh, um, uh, follow up if it comes to the literature on the invalid votes and the connection between the invalidity of the vote and the ballot paper. Uh, as it is uh, pro uh, being projected by the uh, uh, by the commission, uh, and uh, some um, two more thoughts, and uh, I will be wrapping up. Uh, please do remember that if we are comparing the turnout, it should be compared by the similar elections. If we are talking about the presidential elections, we should compare the turnout in different states with the presidential turnout in these elections. And please do keep in your mind that, uh, especially in the um, totalitarian regimes, like for example, in Russia, or like in the communist area in Hungary and in Poland as well, the turnout was rigged as well. So the data are not really usable uh, and it should be stated that sometimes um, it, it, this, this data are really unreliable. And uh, in the case of Russia, there are some exact proofs of how the turnout is being rigged there. And thirdly, um, question uh, to you, uh, because um, about this, uh, how the precinct commission is uh, stating the validity of the vote. Is there a possibility to buy the EMB or by the civil society or by the court in the Liberia and, um, uh, and the other case uh, to do a second check of how the votes were counted? So it, there, if there is a legal possibility in all these two different states to uh, uh, to check the accuracy accuracy of the counting um, in terms of picked precincts or uh, a specific one, and uh, do you know the cases um, uh, cases like uh, like that? And please do let me know, Antonetta, if you would like to get my comments uh, on the paper uh, paper as well. I'm going uh, to Regina and Whitney, and I'm looking. Uh, at Angelina, if I do still have time. Yeah, okay, uh, great. Um, I I am waiting uh, for the uh, for the report because, to be honest, uh, for me, is quite a new perspective. What you are uh, what you are talking about? I come from Poland, and to be honest. 
in my country, we have a lot of electoral issues and we do not see uh, the LGBTQI plus uh, community as being disenfranchised. And we do not understand the need to check how does it work in practice and what is the attitude of the electorate towards um, them or this community as candidates and as uh, elected officials. And we are, a con my country is unfortunately the example of a country in which LGBTQ plus community um, is a, a, a target of the hate speech in election campaigns, in electoral campaigns. And uh, nowadays, we, I think we will make uh, a big step uh, towards um, um, partnership uh, regulation. Yeah. And for me, the issues you talked about are, in the case of Poland, uh, not an electoral issue, but firstly, the issue of other branches of law. If we will exercise the rights of LGBTQI plus community in the administrative law, in front of all the public courts, then I do think that simply the political landscape will make it easier to practice the electoral law. Because if it comes to the regulations, we all are equal. Yeah, of course, there is a lot for us to do in the case of electoral campaign and getting rid. Uh, of the hate speech towards uh, towards this uh, uh, this community. Luckily, we do have some parliamentarians, which do states that they are from this community, and they are trying to do their best to keep their interests on our uh, focus. Uh, waiting for the uh, for the report, and uh, one more time, uh, many thanks for having me here, and many thanks for a very interesting presentation. Okay, that's great.